So I, I'm sure that this is the uh, presentation that everybody came, came out for. We're going to talk about easements, right? Everybody loves easements. What's an easement? And we'll talk about what an easement is. Alright, so, uh, so we're going to go through this. Um, so the title of this uh, presentation, Diversion to the Sagwe. And uh, again, I don't know, for those of you who were here yesterday, um, there was an announcement that in your packet that you received uh, yesterday that has the agenda, there's a, a glossary, there's uh, some definitions of some words. So if you don't know what the Sagwe is, we'll talk about it. But, but uh, some of the other words that we're going to mention today are, are found in that glossary. Um, contemporary, not so contemporary issues surrounding the Aseki East. So you can use that outline. That outline um, is, you know, kind of roughly uh, corresponds to our presentation today. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about what the Aseka system is and how uh, the law protects its integrity. You know, one thing that the, the term integrity I think is really important because as you see through this presentation, I mean, one of the metaphors that I think of Aseka is, is, is as a body. I mean, it's not just me, but you know, there's certain words like a venita. Uh, so if you think about bodily integrity, we're also looking at the seki's integrity and how important it is to preserve and protect all the different aspects or the different body parts of the seki. Um, so that, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, we'll also go over why uh, seki easements and their protection is important. Um, you know, there's going to be some obvious reasons why protecting an seki is important some not so obvious reasons. Uh, because this is a CLE, we'll talk about the statutes and, the, and some of the, the court cases that uh, discuss the second easements. Uh, we'll then look at uh, local land use ordinances. I have uh, three examples that I'm going to talk about. We'll talk about the uh, Taos County uh, City of Española proposed ordinance and uh, the Village of Taos's ordinance. Uh, and, and again, these, these local ordinances to varying, to varying degrees protect the seconds. And we'll talk about which ones are good, better, and best. Um, and then finally, David will, will wrap the presentation up by talking about uh, uh, easements for Asekias on federal land. Okay, so um, what is the Asekia system? So I'm going to ask some folks to uh, raise your hand and tell me what are some key parts of the Asekia system. Anybody? Andrea? Uh, that's that's a great one. What else? What other parts of the Asekia are? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Andrea mentioned the Asekia Madre, the main canal. Anybody else? What other what are the parts of the Asekia are important? Physical parts. Yes, sir. The diversion. The diversion. The point of diversion. Anybody else? Any other yeah. ideas? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry. Olympia. No, La Olympia, that's right. That's an important part of protecting the Asekia's, I mean, that's part of the Asekia's easement, right? Workers will work on the Asekia's easements to clear it out. Any other physical parts of the ditch? Yes, sir. Benitas. Benitas. The source, or the watersheds, the high mountains. That's, a, that's, that's a, where it all begins. You know what? That's, that's something that I don't know we'll touch on today, but that is uh, sometimes uh, a part of the Asekia that we don't think about, but it's really the watershed. That's very important, yes. And then, uh, anybody else? One last one, Bonifacio. The easement, the easement, yeah. And then we'll get to that today and talk about how that easement extends, not only on the main canal, but to the other parts of the system. So someone mentioned Benita. I'm gonna go through this and we'll talk about each of these, these parts of the Asekia system. So, as, as folks mentioned, the diversion. A diversion goes by different names. Uh, presa, Compuerta, Atarque. And I think it's really, it was very interesting, right, that there are different names in Spanish for a diversion. Uh, my understanding is a presa is it's like a diversion dam in the, in the river. And you folks correct me if I'm wrong. A compuerta is sort of the, the main head gate uh, that, that the Asekia takes from the river. And a tarque is sort of like a, sometimes a temporary kind of man-made uh, or a temporary kind of construction on the river to get water to the Asekia. But 
in, in Spanish we have different names for different uh, uh, for, for diversion, the diversion structure on the river. Uh, again, what is the diversion? Where the second takes water from the source, a river or a stream. As folks mentioned, the main canal, that's the key part of the Seca system. Uh, folks mentioned Benitas, these are the lateral ditches. So again, if you think of, of the Aseca as a body part, or a body, you have the main Aseca, and then you have these veins, or these Benitas, that take from the main canal to the individual parcels. Um, they're also known as linderos, and sometimes a lindero can be thought of as a lateral and a lateral. And so again, you're thinking about veins, you're thinking about arteries and, and the capillaries as part of the Aseca system. Um, again, varying in size, lateral ditches. Uh, what's important, you know, this, in Taos especially I've heard of this, is that some of the Benitas themselves on, on Asequias have their own commissions and they have uh, assessed dues, they do their own limpia during the spring. And so again, there's uh, not a one-size-fits-all when it comes to Asequias. And so uh, Benitas themselves may be governed by their own uh, set of rules and commissions. Uh, drainages, again in, in Spanish is the sangre, right? Where does the, where does it uh, end up draining the Aseca? Sometimes it could be in a arroyo, uh, it could be in a river, and sometimes Aseca is dumped into other Asecas. Again, this is a system that's uh, sophisticated, and a lot of times these systems were meant to make the most use, well always, they were meant to make the best use of the water, and so sometimes you'll have tail water from one Aseca going into another. This is all part of the Aseca system. Um, another way to think of this is as infrastructure. So it's not just you know the concrete head, uh, uh, heading or the, the, the diversion or the, the presa that's there, but it's, it's the canal. I mean, the earthen ditch, even if it's not piped, is infrastructure. And so when we talk about uh, preserving the integrity of the Aseca, we're talking about preserving even the traditional earthen ditches. That's part of the infrastructure. Um, as well as you know the more sophisticated uh, Make perhaps more modern um, infrastructure that Asequias may have. And then finally, uh, part of the Asequia system is the traditional points of access. How, ha how have the uh, Asequias through the generations accessed the Asequia? Have they accessed it through private roads? Have they access to private property, uh, public lands? Those are all traditional points of access that's also a key part of the uh, Asequia system. Um, so uh, the Asequia system, uh, also you can think of it as a network. And what I'm going to put up next is sort of a, well, it, it's a definition of the Asequia network that's, in, that's found in a, a proposed ordinance in the city of Espanola that I think really uh, does a great job of recognizing all these different aspects. And it's very, very broad and inclusive. So again, uh, what is the Asequia network in this case? Uh, it's an irrigation ditch, obviously. But it's also all the associated infrastructure, as I mentioned before. And then look at how it's defined. I mean, it, it basically includes every aspect that we just talked about. Um, you have your venas, whether you call them venas, venitas, linderos, this proposed ordinance incorporates all of those terms uh, and is very inclusive. It includes the, the sagüe, uh, a field drainage, uh, outlet for the conveyance of water, and really what's important here is this uh, bunch of lights. There you go. Um, whether or not currently in use, right? Conveyance of water, whether or not currently in use, all the second infrastructure, whether or not currently in use. This ordinance, and we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, uh, is really meant to protect the acequias, whether or not they're in use, which is, uh, you know, some, some would say the ditch has been abandoned, you know, uh, in quotes, then uh, I should have the right to develop and, and do whatever I want. I can pipe, uh, I can build over it. But this 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 uh, ordinance is meant to protect even um, uh, parts of the Asequia network that aren't in use. Um, also includes, like we mentioned before, all traditional uh, or historic access points. Again, a very broad definition, and this is found in a proposed uh, ordinance for the city of Espanola. So, why protect the Asequia easement? Uh, let's, let's hear from folks. What, what are some ideas about why it's important to protect the Asseca? There's going to be obvious ones, maybe not so obvious. What are some thoughts about it? Anyone? Why, why should we protect the Asseca's easement? Yes? So you can access the Asseca Madre from the Madre? That's right. It's, it's very important. Of course, easements provide access. Uh, without that access, uh, what what potential uh, what are some negative consequences of not being able to have that access to that easement? Okay. No water. 
No water. What a fossil. Lack of maintenance. Lack of maintenance. That's right. Anyone else? So this, there's a concept that we talked about yesterday, right, when we had the presentation about prior appropriation. What I think it boils down to is beneficial use, right? We have a, 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 a constitutional provision that defines a water right based on beneficial use. It's, it's measure and limit, right? And so uh, when you are locked out of the acequia, uh, if the acequia is overrun with uh, a haras or some other, you know, obstruction, that's going to impact how much water is delivered to a particular parcel. And that, in turn, is going to have an effect on that person's water rights. And so it's very important, not just you know, for the sake of protecting the easement and its bodily integrity, but it's also important uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we are protecting the, the underlying beneficial use of the water right that those ditches are meant to serve. Um, so here are some, uh, key, again, access, access is key to beneficial use. Here are some statutory uh, references um, that, again, make it clear that access is part of the second easement. One of the handouts that you have that we'll talk about is 7325, um, and that is the, the primary source of, or authority for the second uh, easement rights. But 7283 is found in the Water Code. That's not found in the second statutes. And uh, that makes it actually a misdemeanor. Uh, to prevent convenient access to the Asekias, uh to any diversion works. It doesn't mention a secchia, it just says um, uh, a diversion work. So um, it's important to know that it's not just in the Asekia statutes, but also uh, in the water code. And then 73264 is a complement. It's found in the Asekia statutes, um, but that also makes it illegal to interfere um, with the Asekia and it provides criminal and, and civil penalties. Uh, again, why is the Asekia easement important and why is it important to protect it? Uh, we've already mentioned uh, protection of real property. A water right is real property. Um, and so it's, it's uh, important to protect that property right. And then uh, we'll talk about this case in a minute, but community ditch easements are a dedicated public use. And so what you're doing by protecting the integrity of the Asekia system and the easement is you're preserving that public use that's already been uh, you know, basically grandfathered in through, through time. Um, and then finally, yeah, again, the proper function of a second system depends on the proper functioning of its component parts. And so again, water delivery and good, good governance. And I think, you know, like Bonifacio mentioned, I mean, a clean ditch, a ditch that uh, has no obstructions, um, that, if you were to look at that kind of ditch, you, you think, well, we've got a good system here. We've got active participation by the members. We've got active commissioners that are making sure that there are no hindrances or no encumbrances on the, on, on the ditch. And so I think, um, again, it's, it's a sign of good governance uh, to, be, to be able to see a clean ditch uh, free from obstructions. And we'll take questions at, at, at the end, we'll, the same way we've been doing it. Um, so what is the Asekia easement? Um, so I'm gonna put this up here. This is, this is from a case I just mentioned, the city of Albuquerque versus Garcia. Um, so the, this, this is taken from the case, just lay out the basic facts of the case. But basically the city of Albuquerque uh, proposed to condemn an irrigation ditch. This is uh, 1913, it's a very old case. Um, but I'm curious to, to, to hear from folks as to, as maybe by a show of hands, who thinks that the court ruled in favor of the city of Albuquerque that they had the power to condemn an irrigation ditch? Raise your hands if you... Okay. A lot of you, a lot of you are thinking that, okay, how, and then the rest of you, raise your hands just so I can see, that think that actually uh, the city did not have the ability to condemn an irrigation ditch. Okay. You guys are, are so most of you are pessimists, I think. Um, <laughs> but actually, we had, we did have a good, a good holding in this case. Um, so, this is the language from the court. Uh, undoubtedly, you the diversion distribution of water for irrigation and other domestic purposes in New Mexico. In other Western states, where irrigation necessary is a public purpose. We already talked about the Asequia as being there as a public use. The easement is a public use. Um, so it's in our view, therefore, that the use to which the irrigation ditch in question was devoted was a public use. And so it was not possible for the city to condemn the Asequia that had already been dedicated to a public use. Now there's, 
it, it, things have changed a little bit. We have, a, I think there's a statute that talks about the Board of Finance now that, you know, if one political subdivision and another political subdivision want to, uh, you know, um, change the, the purpose of use of their, or they want to change their, their property, it has to go to the Board of Finance. But in any case, uh, this was a good case, right? I mean, it, it basically uh, told the city that, that this, this uh, easement had already been dedicated to, the, to a public use. Um, so now we'll talk about the primary, the uh, primary authority for the Asekis easements and it's found in that handout that you have, which is 7325. Um, so David asked the question, well, what, what is an easement? So there's a case, uh, Cox, which cited Kennedy versus Bond, um, that dealt into, and this is a pretty, pretty you know, standard definition of what an easement is, uh, a liberty, privilege, right, or advantage which one has in the land of another. Um, so if you look at the specific language of 7325, um, what does it do? It establishes an easement for irrigation ditches. Uh, five years continuous use. Okay, so again, five years of continuous use and you've got yourself an irrigation ditch in here. Um, now, the way the court uh, in Cox v. Hannon, I think that was Judge, it was Judge Wexler's decision. Uh, Judge Wexler, as most of the attorneys know, or non-attorneys, is that uh, Judge Wexler's a water judge, right? And so I think it's relevant that he, he, he found some of these things in this case, but that it's a statutory prescriptive easement. Um, now, the, the standard for prescriptive easements, also taken from Cox, but also another case law, it's evidence of open, uninterrupted, peaceful, notorious, you gotta meet most of these elements, right? Uh, adverse use under claim of right for a prescriptive period within the owner's construct. Lots to take in. The bottom line, though, is that in New Mexico for prescriptive easements, I believe it's 10 years, but the statute um, for irrigation ditches is actually five years. So it, you can see that the legislature gave some importance to irrigation ditch easements and said, well, for prescriptive easements, when it comes to an irrigation ditch, we're going we're gonna to codify it and say it's five years as opposed to the normal 10 years for prescriptive uh, for the prescriptive period. Um, you know, as I, I we, we deal with this statute a lot in, in my practice, in David's practice, right, because there's always complaints about interference with the second easement. And so, uh, the way I've, I've started to understand uh, 7325 is sort of in two, two ways, and I think for property attorneys, uh, you know, I'm not a property attorney, but those of you that are, you might be able to, uh, you know, tell me if I'm right or wrong about this, but there's negative easements and, and, and affirmative easements, or positive easements. And so I think that 7325, whether it was intended to do this or not, is very, is very, um, uh, it, it deals with both negative and affirmative easements. So we'll talk about negative easement first. Uh, this negative easement, the concept of negative easement, tells, uh, tells uh, basically says what the, uh, the landowner uh, cannot do on the easement. And so 7325 says it makes it illegal to interfere with the easement or prevent access to the ditch. Um, now it appears, if you read that statute that I handed out, this is a point of confusion a lot of times, is that it says it appears to allow alterations or changes to the servient estate, that means the irrigation ditch, uh, so long as those changes don't interfere with the use or prevent access. But that actually was uh, adopted in 1941. And so, just by looking at the statute, a landowner might say to the estate, well, I can do whatever I want to with the ditch, so long as it doesn't interfere with, um, uh, it doesn't interfere with the use of the ditch or prevent access, but actually, uh, that's only for irrigation ditches that were created after 1941, under the statute, the prescriptive period is passed after 1941. Um, and of course, uh, well, and so the, the counter to that is that if it's been in use prior to 1941, you still got to go to the dominant estate or the assecchio or the lateral owner and ask permission to make those changes. Um, <clears throat> And of course, almost all of our secchias in New Mexico, I would say 99.9% .9 of them, there are a few outliers, were constructed before um, even 1907, right? That's, that's the, the adoption of the, of the Territorial Water Code that we talked about yesterday. And so most of the secchias are, are gonna fall into that category of a pre-1941 amendment, meaning that um, uh, 
it, uh, the landowner cannot make changes that are going to impact, uh, cannot make changes at all without the permission of the city. Uh, again, the water code. Um, and uh, uh, again, we talked about this yesterday. Most of the time, water rights and the executive share the same priority date. So, you know, it doesn't matter what part of the executive you're talking about. Um, most of the time, all the executive is going to share the same priority date. And they're all going to be constructed for the most part prior to 1907, prior to the 1941 amendment. So the other thing, uh, I mentioned a negative easement, but 7325 also talks about what the dominant estate, what the Asekia, or the irrigation ditch owner, can do uh, with their easement. What is the purpose of the easement? So it establishes what the easement owner is permitted to do. Um, it allows for reasonable maintenance, use, and improvements. Of course, what is reasonable? No. That's why people litigate to find out what's reasonable. We'll talk about what some examples of reasonableness are. And then again, this is a broad standard, right? Easement law um, places limitations on what an easement owner may do, and we see a broad standard in the statute uh, given to a second and irrigation ditch uh, easements that uh, really is about reasonableness for maintenance use and improvements. Uh, real quickly, preventing violations. So, um, that's what I wanted to say about this. Okay, so here's some examples of when it's made its way to the court, what the court has found to be reasonable or not reasonable. Uh, the court answered in Archibek, in the, in the case of Archibek, what is, what is interference? Moving the location of the ditch, but keeping the ditch within the easement, covering and closing the ditch, even if doing so does not interfere with the beneficial use of water. So you can see that in this case, I mean, the landowner felt like he could make those changes. Uh, so long as it didn't interfere with the beneficial use of water. Uh, but that, in effect, was um, moving, the, moving the location of the ditch with an easement, covering and closing it, uh, was, was um, interference. Uh, preventing access, uh, erecting a fence, moving a berm, and making it impossible to use a tractor uh, to, maintain, um, to maintain the ditch. And then it was remanded back to the district court on uh, the, the placement of culverts and water gates. Um, so in Cox, uh, the dominant estate, what can the dominant estate owner do? They can use mechanized tools to clean and maintain a ditch. And this is, this is, you know, probably David will touch on this in terms of uh, forests on, on federal land. Uh, for off of federal land, I mean, again, you have, you don't have to go in there with just a shovel to clean the ditch. The court has held that it's reasonable to use modern ways of cleaning the ditch. That's a reasonable uh, use under 7325. And, um, and that there's no set distance. So continuous use beyond the prescribed distance um, can actually create additional irrigation ditch rights uh, under Cox. So you're not necessarily confined to, um, to a particular distance. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide uh, just real quickly about you know who decides whether an easement exists. The short answer is the state engineer does not. Um, <laughs> that's good, right? Uh, prosecuting violations, and then just real quickly, what the statute uh, 7325 does. I mean, it's it's not only a criminal uh, act to interfere with the ditch, but there's um, civil civil penalties, and of course, uh, the parties can seek an injunction. But take a look at a civil penalty not to exceed five thousand dollars, right? If it's knowing, uh, willing, and intentional, there's actually a, a for the criminal the criminal side of it ninety days in jail. I've never known of anybody serving time for interfering with the ditch. I'm waiting for that to happen. It hasn't happened yet. Um, but what's interesting about this is that it's the district attorney can actually file not only the criminal complaint uh, but the civil uh, can file a civil. Our experience with the district attorneys, however is that one, they're overworked. They've, they've got murders to solve. Uh, the last thing they want to do is get, uh, get a water case on their, on their, uh, on their case. So even though the statute specifically requires or asks that the DA get involved. Um, the other thing is that uh, they, they don't tend to, most of the time district, office, district attorney's offices are staffed with criminal attorneys. So they don't know about the civil side of the law. And so it's, we're sort of in this process now of trying to figure out how we can get district attorneys to understand these statutes and to start prosecuting, at least to start setting an example. Maybe we'll get some good case law and uh, we can, um, you know, use that to uh, get folks to stop interfering with our sectors. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, injunctive relief. 
Um, so now I'm going to talk about land use ordinances and um, how acequias uh, are protected under three different uh, three different models. Um, Taos County, and this, these are in the sort of the, the preambles, or you know what what the uh, purpose of the ordinances are. Taos County says it's, it's the goal of these regulations to protect the quality and quantity of the water and resources and the centers. So you know I, these are also examples that for those of you that are land use attorneys or or you know get involved in land use matters, um, a lot of a lot of our codes or land use ordinances and regulations specifically re reference the centers. I think it's important that that. You know, at some point, uh, county government has recognized that executives are important and it, it's made its way into uh, ordinances. The uh, town of Taos has a water policy statement that's going to encourage the maintenance of the Taos Valley's executive system for education purposes. And then the city of Espanola's comprehensive plan passed in 2017 uh, says that they should be protected to the greatest extent possible. Now, again, this is we're going to talk about whether it's just lip service, right? I mean, it really, what it comes down to is when they get an application, uh, when a, a, a county commission or a, a planning zoning board gets uh, an application in front of them for development, are they really looking at these ordinances closely? Or, you know, are they going to prevent a developer from developing their land when there's an ASEC on it? And we'll talk about a case uh, recently decided that um, that requires at least Taos County uh, to, to do that, to make sure that they're protecting the ASEC so Taos County's uh, land use regulations, um, I call it good because while well, it was a subject of litigation, how they define the secular, and we'll get to the definition of the secular in a minute. Uh, but again, you can see that there's protections in there. Uh, no secular, and we'll, again, we'll see what the definition of a secular is. Whether on-site or off-site shall be disturbed um, by, by development. And all the secular shall remain open and uncovered. Uh, unless they've gotten permission from the Executive Commission. Uh, again, this is, a, again, a, I think, a, a sign that there's something special about earth and ditches. There's something, um, you know, whether you want to talk about ecological benefits or just the traditional aspect of open ditches, at least Taos County's ordinance pays some lip service or some service to the idea that they should remain uh, uncovered. Um, now, it's interesting because when it comes to setbacks, uh, they have their own setback in the Taos County regulations uh, from Asequias and I don't know what's meant by legal uh, laterals or legal that it does or Asequias again. Some problems with the, with the ordinance in terms of how uh, uh, the language that they use. Um, but there's this, also this provision about uh, more or less establishing the Asequia bylaws. I won't get into the Asequia bylaws because, again, when I talked about negative and affirmative easements, I think the bylaws are a good place to start for the Asequia, but I think a lot of times people will look at the Asequia's bylaws and say, oh, 10 feet from the middle of the ditch to, to uh, either side. That could be interpreted as a negative easement. That could be interpreted as saying no building within that 10 feet, landowner. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's you know, what about that reasonableness? If the Asequia needs to go in there, they need to use more, uh, more, more than the 10 feet. Do they have a right under the statute to, to, to do that? And I think uh, an argument can be made that they, they are, regardless of what's in the bylaws. Um, also interesting, uh, notices of an application for development have to go to an ASECA uh, if it's within the property. Okay, definition of an ASECA. Um, referring to both the irrigation ditch, and you can read that up there, the organization of Marcianos, not a great definition of an asequia, but that's what we had. So, what do you what do you all think? Um, given given my this this requirement here that no asequia shall be disturbed in any way, can anyone take a guess as to what an issue might have arisen uh, because of this definition and the requirement that they go to a, a commission for approval? And we'll talk about the case, Andrea. Maybe the lateral was covered. That's that's right. I mean, the question is whether, under the uh, the the uh, definition of a secchia, I'll give you the, the facts here. Whether under the definition of a secchia, a lateral ditch is included in there that requires permission from uh, the Asequia's commission. So in this case is the Asequia Monument Nano case, uh, Taos County. Here's the, the title. It made its way up to the Court of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court, which recently denied a petition for writ. Um, Basic facts, the developer being closed, open irrigation ditches. Okay. 
again, I'm, I'm very cautious about saying, I'm not calling it an acequia, it's an irrigation ditch, whether it's a acequia madre or a lateral irrigation ditch, because that's what the statute says. Remember, 7325 says irrigation ditches. Uh, enclose the irrigation ditches that serve his property and another that serve a, a neighboring property. He also built a wall that prevented access to a junction box. So if you can imagine, the ditch is split, and he built a big retaining wall that prevented, they usually would travel through his property to access the junction box to be able to adjust the head gates. And he prevented them from doing that. So now they had to go around other properties, walk along the road, which they said was dangerous. And so um, that was one of the things that he did. Uh, and then again, the traditional access to the junction box was on the development property. Um, so what did the county commission do? The planning commission approved the permit because they said there was no acequia within uh, 20 feet of the project. So they read the rule and they said, our interpretation is there's no acequia there. The district court upheld the county commission decision and they, the, the, the district court had the right question is whether a lateral ditch of the other ditch, the second model, uh, located on the, prop, on the project site would require review and approval from the second commission. Um, if such approval was necessary, the county's decision would not have been in conformance with the law. But the court said, the second model de Llano was not within 20 feet of the project. Acequia Madre de Llano. Okay, a lot of acequias are known as an acequia Madre de whatever, right? In this case, it's Acequia Madre de Llano. Doesn't mean that there aren't parts of the Acequia Madre, like the whole Acequia system, um, you know, like lateral ditches. So if a lateral ditch, in this case, is found on that property, wouldn't we say that it's part of the Acequia Madre de Llano? Maybe not the Acequia Madre, is, maybe that's not found on the property, but a part of the Acequia Madre is found on the property. But anyways, the court said second model that Yanni was not found uh, within 20 feet. Um, court of Appeals had a decision, and like I said, a petition for it was filed. And we'll talk about the Court of Appeals issues in a minute. And then just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Supreme Court denied the petition. So the Court of Appeals decision uh, was upheld. Uh, well, it wasn't reviewed. So what do you guys think? The pessimists in the room. The Court of Appeals say, District Court, you got it right, no acequia madre, developer did not need permission to commission. Raise your hand if you think the uh, Court of Appeals upheld the District Court. Okay. And everybody else thinks that the Court of Appeals said, District Court, County, you got it wrong? Okay. More optimistic. this time. <laughs> so we, we wrote an amicus. Um, and we are, you know, basically saying that it was contrary to the, to the land use regulations themselves. It was contrary to law, the decision that placing ditches and culverts without the express approval of Seki Madre and Yama was contrary to the, their own regulations. And then, of course, we cited to Posey and Cox, which are some of these um, cases that, that interpreted 7325. Um, but these are the particular uh, regulations that we said they did not follow. Remember that? Uh, in, in the land use regulations for Taos County, they, they were giving hopefully more than just lip service to a second, and they actually said this. A second easement recognized by municipal law shall be honored, and uh, the intention of the regulations is to augment and enhance state laws. What is 7325? It's a state law. What is all the court decisions interpreting 7325? It's a state law. So the county uh, acted contrary to their own regulations by approving them. And Mickey, can I ask you a question that some people may be wondering? Sure. So the, the people who went against the Aseca in this were saying that the lateral is not an Aseca. But, uh, but my question is, on the Aseca Madre del Llano, the lateral that went onto this property in dispute, were those people members of the Aseca del Llano? Did they vote? Did they pay dues to the Aseca del Llano? Or did they have their own separate lateral that was administered separately? That's a good question. I mean, in this case, as I mentioned before, some of these benitas or lateral ditches have their own commissions. No, they were all dues paying members. Of the Asequimadre. Uh, of the Asequimadre. They were all dues paying members of the Asequimadre. Um, and, and the developer himself, as we mentioned, you know, he put his ditch in the, in the pipe. He was also a dues paying member of the Asequimadre. Uh, so the Court of Appeals had some interesting things to say. Um, that laterals were intended to the same protection as an Asequimadre under the land use regulations. Um, they said an Asequia refers to all types of Asequias and laterals as provided under the regulation. 
And under this construction, the lateral at issue should not have been disturbed without express permission from the appropriate second commission for its maintenance operation. The appropriate commission was the second modern and governance commission. Um, and so accordingly, they reversed the district court's decision and hold that the impacted lateral in this case is in fact an asecchio. Duh, but yeah, that's what they have, right? A lateral ditch isn't a second under the land use regulations. Um, okay, so that was that was an example of uh, Kaus County. Um, AJ, how much time do we have? We are right Okay, so I'll finish up real quickly so David can get to his piece. Um, okay, uh, we've got uh, Town of Taos, uh, any proposal for development, and development is defined broadly as we see, containing any portion of second network, again, uh, defined as the network, uh, shall comply with the requirements of the approval process. This is how a second network is defined in the Town of Taos's ordinances. Uh, community ditch, Defined by state law, and there are there are state laws that tell you what you know whether uh, uh, a particular irrigation ditch qualifies as a as an secular community ditch. Uh, but they use some some words, right? A secular versa, lateral vena or venita, a presa, con fuerza, desagüe, including the applicable town of town or secular commission mandate and maintenance. Uh, I have some issues with maintenance easement because maintenance, you know, again, easements are not just for maintenance. Um, and so for development, again, it's a broad, a broad uh, definition, including fences, walls, driveways, and roads, right? So it's a pretty, pretty good, uh, thorough description of what the second network is and, and would impose any kind of development, even fences, to, to get the uh, permission of the executive commissions. Now, what I like about Espanola's proposed ordinance and uh, ill projects, stands for Irrigated Lands Protection Overlay District. Um, so just a quick kind of looking at this at this diagram. So the uh, as I mentioned here, blue are the this is the city limits. We the this funny shaped the, this funny shape here is the city limits of Espanola. And there's quite a few acequias that are running through the city limits of Espanola. Um, and so this uh, proposed ordinance is sort of a carrot and stick approach, right? The, the stick, in, in a way, right, is that it recognizes and protects the second easements, um, requiring a second commission approval for any development, also a very broad standard of what an asequia is and a broad definition of what a development is. Um, but it also incentivizes developers to keep water rights and beneficial use, to first figure out whether there are any water rights on that property. I mean, even you're, if you, you know, if you go to Espanola and probably in a lot of other municipalities where there's acequias, it's kind of mind-boggling to me that property owners, they will pave over, like to put in a sonic, for example. They will put in a sonic without thinking about the water rights that they own. I mean, those are valuable property rights for not only economically valuable, but valuable to the community. Um, and they have no plan for the water rights. So this, this proposed ordinance would require the developer to develop a plan and offers incentives like variances if they are able to keep those water rights in beneficial use. Again, you can see that uh, you know, lots of the secchias in Espanola and just about the entire city is uh, part of this overlay district. And so any development is going to have to comport with those requirements that are in that, uh, in that proposed ordinance. So I'll turn it over to David to go to the federal law in the second easement's portion. Thank you, Enrique. Um, what, why would an ASECA be on federal land is, is the first question. Why, why, first question, why would this even be an issue? Uh, I thought irrigated lands were private lands. Well, the answer is, is that yes, irrigated lands are private lands, but oftentimes the boundary of the Forest Service goes all the way up to the edge of the private lands that are irrigated, and the diversion is upstream from the first piece of private land, and the diversion in the first several hundred yards, quarter mile or whatever, of the acequia might be running through federal land before it gets to the boundary, Forest Service boundary, and then starts serving the private lands that are just outside of, of the Forest Service or BLM or whatever we're talking about. Um, and, and an interesting historical point is these diversion points used to be on, not on Forest Service land, where did they used to be on? Land-grant land common lands. 
That's right. So when land grant common lands got stripped from many uh, land grants that we heard about yesterday, um, that's what created this thing where the land grant common lands passed from uh, a lumber company to a land speculator to someone else to someone else and then finally to the Forest Service. So the Forest Service is today the owner of what used to be common lands and that's why some of these initial sections of the Asafia are on federal land and the issue arises as to what's the nature of the easement um, on federal land. And um, the, um, there's a law passed in 1866 called RS-2339 that actually provides a congressional grant of easement for irrigation ditches located on federal land. So if there is any doubt that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, some other concept or document protected easement rights that existed um, before this became part of the United States, the federal government said, if you have an irrigation ditch on federal land, um, we hereby, by an act of Congress, give you a grant of easement for that irrigation ditch on federal land as it passes uh, through the federal land. Um, now, later on, after 1866, law, other laws were passed in the 20th century that um, made things more restrictive, imposed uh, permitting requirements or other things like that, always grandfathering in uh, the prior ditches with the prior rights until you got to FLIPMA, Federal Lands Policy Management Act, I can't remember, of 1976, and that repealed that stat the 1866 statute altogether, but kept intact any easements, any safety easements or irrigation ditch easements that had been um, uh, grandfathered in and protected up until then. Um, and the criteria that you have to meet on the bottom, if you can't read it, um, to continue to have an easement today, if you had one of those old easements, is that the ditch must have been constructed before the reservation of federal land into national forest, wilderness, or some other specific type of federal land, not general type of federal land. The ditch must serve a still valid water right, and there have to have been no major alterations in the ditch. In other words, you can't move upstream a half a mile and, and have your diversion point a half a mile upstream and the Aseke now running through a piece of land that it never ran through before. That would be a major alteration. If your Aseke is more or less in the same spot that it always historically has been uh, and there haven't been major alterations, then, um, then this, uh, this federal grant of easement still applies. Um, and next slide. So nearly every Aseke in New Mexico meets these three criteria because of how old they are because most of them predated the Forest Service and most of them haven't had uh, major alterations and continue to serve uh, still valid water rights. And for that reason, then the federal agency that administers these lands now has to honor the Aseca um, and is not, uh, and, and honoring the Aseca means that, um, that you can't say, oh, there's a federal law that um, that protects the land, it doesn't allow you to, like the Wilderness Act, for example, and doesn't allow you to do something, because all these acts, like FLIPMA, FLIPMA, I'm sorry, and the Wilderness Act all had grandfathering provisions in them that said, we passed this Wilderness Act, but existing rights are, are to be protected. FLIPMA said the same thing. And so agencies um, have to continue, even in the face of these federal uh, land use acts, these more modern ones, have to continue to honor the, um, the Asenkia. And it also means that they're not subject to permit uh, requirements for normal operation maintenance. Now this is where the issues, the disputes that we get involved in happen, is that some 70 year old guy goes out onto federal land, just upstream from his private land, to where the ditch diverts from the stream, uh, but it's technically federal land and does what he or she has done for decades and decades. They, they take a bobcat or something and they clean out the ditch. And we've had cases where the, that person was slapped with a, uh, a federal cr criminal complaint and brought before a federal magistrate for doing that, um, for doing what they've always done. Um, on an Aseke whose easement is honored, uh, should be honored because of the laws that I mentioned. Um, but there, but aside from just individuals getting in trouble, um, which is a serious matter, uh, you know, criminal criminal charges. The problem is is that um, if if the, federal, if the federal agency succeeds in imposing a permit requirement on you going and do, doing maintenance on your ditch, the permit requirement becomes a major federal action. The major federal action invokes NEPA. 
And so a whole environmental review process has to be done in this laser project. And then you, the ESSEC, are going to be responsible for $10,000 or more of cost share for the NEPA uh, studies that are done. And no ESSEC has $10,000 to spare. And so that all comes from the permit requirement that the agencies are, um, are requiring. Um, and so um, we have um, there, um, we have fought against the permit requirement, and there's a uh, case law out of the 10th Circuit, and if you, uh, the 10th Circuit is the, thank you, I'm gonna finish up in one minute here. The 10th Circuit is the court just below the Supreme Court, which covers this part of the, the Rocky Mountain West, co covers this part of the country. So this 10th Circuit decision actually applies to New Mexico, even though someone could argue that it doesn't apply to other parts of the state. And that is the next slide. Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, a 2005 case, um, in which the court distinguished between construction and maintenance, and said if you're doing construction on your easement, um, you have to get a permit and you have to consult with the agency. But if you're only doing maintenance on the, uh, on the easement, then you don't have to consult with the agency and you don't have to get a permit from them. And they, uh, and basically, it's kind of what I talked about. If there's a major change, um, then no, that doesn't come under your easement. But if you're just doing any kind of maintenance, repair, even something called replacement in kind, where you're replacing an existing piece of infrastructure with a new thing, but it's the same thing, even though it's new, that that doesn't require a permit. Now, the interesting caveat about this case is this case had to do with roads and not ditches. Um, why am I saying that this helps the Sekis? Because the road easement came about because of the same 1866 act that I was describing before, just a different section, RS-2477, protected road easements, that was at issue here, RS-2339, same act, protects its irrigation ditches, and so it stands to reason that the same reasoning that they would use in terms of how they would define construction and maintenance would also apply um, to ditches, and therefore, um, uh, this case basically supports our interpretation of when a permit is required and when a permit is not required. The Forest Service is coming along extremely slowly and reluctantly and not even all the way to relinquishing what they want, which is permitting control over everything that happens even when they don't have the right to require the permit. So it's still an ongoing issue. And now we have about seven minutes for questions. Do you have anything else to close? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you mentioned about um, tracking uh, interference with ditches in Taos County and, and how the DA uh, may not have time to do anything about it. Is there any way to request or mandate that the individual uh, SECDAS report when this happens, <clears throat> at, at least to the DA and then at the state level keep metrics on it? Not that blocking water leads to murder, but yeah, I mean the DA is dealing with murders and other things, but at least get the metrics. Yeah, well, so I think right now, um, so we recently worked with the NSECA on the CEO, and they've been having some discussions with the Attorney General's office, and I think uh, hopefully some folks at the Attorney General's office will be trying to, you know, hopefully discussing with District Attorneys and trying to get some of that information, because I think it's important not, you know, to kind of know which cases, how often the NSECA is reporting to the District Attorneys, and to get a sense of when when the action rises to the level that the district attorneys will get involved, it's rare. There are have been a couple of cases, um, but you know this point about uh, violence. I mean, almost all of these cases involve some kind of confrontation, and a lot of them, um, you know, especially in the, in the case of La Mesilla, uh recently. I mean, the, the the bad actor was a bad actor. I mean, he he threatened the commissioners. I mean, uh, verbally threatened them, but but there it can rise to the level of violence, and I think that's why um, you know water brings out the best and sometimes the worst. Of people. And I'll just add, La Masia, by the way, is near Espanola, as many of you probably know. But I will also add that um, of all the counties in New Mexico, the one county in which the DA has historically taken the most. Uh, active role in protecting a is and using their powers that are in the statute to protect the has has been task on by far.
and somehow mandated to every level of law enforcement, surveyors, and uh, of course you by attorneys. But how can we prosecute if an officer writes a report that says, I did not see a crime being committed when he was handed a video of trespass and obstruction of my lab. How? It starts with the police court. Any question? Yeah, they, on, on this issue of the protection of the of the easement, uh, my experience has been is that if your bottom rows are written well, especially when it identifies your second, and it includes the laterals of the second, it's a good starting point to reference protecting those the seconds. The second part is being having those the seconds registered in the county and in the state as a legal document that identifies that easement size of those easements, the size of the seconds, of what that would work for the court. The downfall on it is that if they're identified in your bylaws, technically the commission or the pacientes have incurred the responsibility of maintaining also those values. Okay? So you can have technically like you do DPS on seconds, the main value on seconds, whatever. There may be some of those laterals that are subject to also being cleaned by that, by those pionets, by that commission. You know, so it says that it's a sword that cuts both ways. If you're taking on that, you start taking on that responsibility, putting them on your bylaws, you're going to maintain those levels. And some so, levels, I don't. So the only thing I would say that's a little different from what you said, Bonifacio, is that, is that um, I think you can have uh, a second bylaws that define the Ezequiel, including all its laterals, and you're right, that's a good start. And I think if your Ezequiel bylaws say that the, the individual members who live along the lateral are responsible for cleaning, and they do it, um, that's fine. Now, there can be a dispute over who does it or not, but I think the main thing is is that then when someone tries to attack the Ezequiel uh, easement, um, either a lateral or the main ditch or something like that, that, that all the officers of the ditch have a responsibility to, to defend that, and they don't just throw it in the lap of the four or five lateral owners and say, you guys take care of this, because sometimes it's necessary to get the, the authority of the commission um, behind whoever is violating uh, the easement. So, but yeah, I, don't, I think it, it, it's not necessarily that um, everyone on the Asekia has, to, if you have a custom of everyone being responsible for their lateral and that customer is being honored, um, I don't think there's anything I'm awful about that. Two minutes. Any more questions? Are people ready for the lunch? <laughs> yes, sir. How are the powers, excuse me, all the Ezequias originate on the watersheds, in the watersheds. There is no mechanism to protect the quality of that water because it's in the hands of the U.S. Forest Service, BLM, uh, uh, who else, an environmental protection agency. Two instances, when we have forest fires, they spray that chemical, I've seen the Asekia, ugly black chemical, you know. One instance, the other is the mining, they're gonna impact our headwaters. Who, can't you put bylaws into the Asekia that address quality? even though they may not have any teeth in them yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll let David uh, answer too. I mean, my, my first thought is that, I mean, you know, bylaws are a really important place for secures to, again, lay out the rights and responsibilities of the members. They can certainly include some of that language in their bylaws, but it's it's such a, it's a document that is really supposed to just pertain to the secure and its members, right? Um, but I think those kinds of discussions should be taking place on the Asekia level to figure out where Asekias, um, where they need to be involved. I mean, they, they shouldn't just be looking, like you're saying, at, at their own ditch and governance of their ditch, but they need to be taking a holistic view of, of the watershed and where, you know, what agencies do they need to be reaching out to and, and what uh, processes do they need to take place, uh, you know, do they need to be involved in, like forest management plants. And another thing, I hate to diverge a little, but that Produced Water Act, where it's going to be legal for us to use uh, fracking water for irrigation, et cetera, et cetera. That's in the works now. So we've got to just quality of water because 
they're saying, oh boy, what a deal, we'll give you all this almost free toxic water. Don't worry about it. Don't the water shit. Okay, so, I don't know, there are a lot of protections. We have to come together to Thank figure you. it out. Thank you. And you know, it's not just, and this is just to close out because it's time for lunch, yeah. but not, it's not even just agencies, but anyone upstream from Minnesota who's impairing the water quality, whether it's a government agency or whether it's a private actor or whatever, we have to become more familiar, like I, I'd be the first to admit, I'm not all that familiar with water quality laws and how to enforce water quality. My practice has mainly been water rights and easements and land grants. And so, uh, but that's an area of law that we need to become familiar with and we need to know how to how you enforce those rights. Help everyone. And I think we are at lunchtime, is that right? Uh, well, we're going to break for lunch. We're also going to have our keynote speaker right. as well. So we'll have uh, but do you want to, does someone want to say how this is going to work? So, uh, before we get started with the lunch, before we get started with the lunchtime keynote, uh, we're going to have folks grab their lunches, and then it's going to be sort of a a, a lunch and listen. Um, so.